I think, Aaron, we're at 1102. If we want to just do a quick 10 second intro for each of the COT staff who are here, and then we can jump right into the presentation. Yes. So, we need to it. So, welcome everyone to our recuperative care virtual information session. We're so grateful to have you here today to be sharing about this program. Um, today, you'll be hearing from a few different staff. Um, I, my name is Erin Kruger. I'm the development director here at COTS. We we'll have Chris Cabral, our CEO, Julia Gaines, with our recuperative care team, and Garrett Crane, who is with our shelter program. Um, so we are um, excited to have you. Just a few housekeeping uh, notes. Please stay on mute. We will have Q&A at the end. Um, as, you're, as you think of questions, please pop them into the chat. We will be answering them. We'll have time at the end. Um, we will be, this meeting is recorded. Um, we will be sending out the recording and the slides following um, this, following the conclusion of the program. So um, again, we're, I'll admit people as they come in, um, but we're just so grateful that you're here and excited to be sharing about this program with you. Um, all right, so here are our presenters today again. Um, we all have a few things that we're gonna be sharing with you and we're really excited. Um, so COTS, um, COTS are Committee on the Shelter List. Um, um, we have been around for over 35 years. We were founded in 1988 um, by two local women who saw people in our community that were experiencing homelessness and wanted to do something about it. Um, we started as an entirely volunteer organization when we've grown today, um, where we have our Mary Isaac Center, Probably most of you are familiar with is here in Petaluma, the 90 plus emergency bed shelter. We offer enhanced case management. Um, we provide two hot meals a day um, to residents and anyone in need in the community. Um, it's three, two twice a day, every day of the week. Residents also um, have breakfast available to them. And then also on site at our Petaluma at 900 Hopper, we have People's Village, and recuperative care. Um, we also have a variety of other services um, that you can read more about on our website, or we're happy to connect um, after this meeting um, about what's going on. We have our Kids First Family Shelter, which is a seven-bed shelter in Petaluma um, that is for families. It is the only family shelter in South County. Um, there's a very long waiting list, um, but we are really grateful for that program. We offer community housing. Um, so we offer a variety of permanent supportive housing throughout Sonoma County, where COTS offers uh, supportive services to residents um, through homes that we must release um, or work with landlords. Um, the most obvious one with that is our the biggest pro project with that is um, this um, sorry, I'm moving on to resident services. Um, resident services is our program where we provide su supportive services to other housing projects. So the most obvious one is our studios at Montero, um, which is a recently converted uh, hotel um, into studio into studio apartments. Um, and then we also provide those same services to a project in Runner Park called Vida Nueva. And then we also offer homelessness supports um, through every housing and um, in Santa Rosa supportive services and be on the lookout for an event in November for a virtual information session about a new program called Keep People Housed. It is a first of a kind uh, program here in the county um, that will be offering preventative uh, funds to keep people housed. Um, it's a partnership between COTS and four other, five other agencies funded by the cities of Petaluma and Santa Rosa, Sonoma County, and Alcom. Um, so um, that is in a nutshell COTS. <laughs> um, and with the expansion, I just wanted to take a moment to thank our funders and our construction partners, um, specifically Fatima Lazar, who um, was a big component in making this project um, possible. 
um, the William J. Irwin Foundation and the Church of Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ. Um, so um, all of these people were hugely instrumental in moving this project forward. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Cabral to talk about why we, why recuperative care um, benefits our community. Sure. I'll be really quick about it. I know all of you want the meaty details of the program. Uh, the purpose of this program is to be able to assist unsheltered members of our community who are ex exiting hospital and clinical settings who need a little bit of extra time to recover. And, it, you know, if those hospitals exited them uh, out to the streets, they would inevitably end right back up into emergency center care. Um, we want to avoid emergency room visits as much as possible for this population and provide the care that they need to, you know, recover and recuperate and be ready for permanent housing of their own. Um, just as a, as a quick side note, it costs us about $200 a day per person that is enrolled in our recuperative care for, you know, meals, care services, shelter. Uh, when you compare that to the average emergency room hospital stay in the community, that is a savings of about $7,800 per day per person, uh, which with 20 beds reaches well over $30 million a year in savings to the community as a whole. Uh, we have very, very high occupancy in this program, often run a waiting list, uh, and we've got a ton of hospital partners out there who utilize this program to, you know, ensure that the folks that they're serving in their hospitals have somewhere safe and helpful to go so that they do end up in permanent housing. Uh, we are really, really excited to expand this program. We've been operating it here for several years with six beds. Moving up to 20 is a big expansion for us, but we anticipate that this will better need, meet the needs of the community, including you know, our clinical care partners, hospital partners, uh, to provide better services and make sure that folks have a place where they can go to recover and get on the road to permanent housing instead of ending back up in that kind of consistent cycle of in and out of the emergency room. So that's the purpose of this program. Thank you all for joining. Uh, Julia and Garrett will have a lot more information about the inner workings of the program, and I will pass it over to them. Thank you so much, Chris. Hi, everybody. Julia Gaines. Um, I've been with COTS, uh, well, since the recuperative care unit opened in January of 2020. Um, I know lots of you. It's great to see everyone here today. Um, I will go ahead and just start with the basics, just do some level setting in case um, you're not familiar with recuperative care. Um, essentially, the definition is residential post-acute care for people experiencing homelessness who are discharging from a medical facility and need a clean, safe environment in which to continue recovering from illness or surgery or injury. Um, this is basically the standard throughout recuperative care around the country. Next slide. Um, at the very minimum, recuperative care programs should offer 24-7 access to a bed. Um, historically, shelters did not offer um, a bed during the day. People had to leave during the day, and this wasn't helpful for folks that had chronic conditions, acute conditions. Um, they couldn't continue, you know, recovering from them if they didn't have a bed 24-7. Um, also, three meals a day, of course, are provided. Health care coordination, everything from making those doctor's appointments to scheduling the transportation uh, to getting prescription refills um, that is offered in recuperative care, as well as case management, uh, applying for benefits and working on housing. So what does COTS recuperative care offer? Well, I can tell you we, we do offer above the bare minimum, uh, that's for sure. Um, we do have hospital beds that are adjustable for people's needs, um, privacy curtains, um, just to give them, you know, a sense of privacy, um, especially when they're kind of in a vulnerable state, um, you know, recovering from illness and injury. Uh, we offer locked storage uh, for personal belongings. It's very important to have a safe space to store your medications and everything like that. Um, we do have an ADA compliant bathroom and shower uh, to make it accessible for all of our clients. Uh, meal service, as Aaron mentioned, is provided by Mary's Table. Uh, daily, and um, we will now, with our expansion, have the ability to store medically tailored meals, which can be delivered to uh, clients um, in recuperative care that have cardiac conditions, cancer, diabetes, and uh, the meals will really help them with those conditions. Um, of course, we offer toiletries, clothing, earbuds, phone chargers, and any other needed items. I have to say phone chargers are probably the number one needed item 
uh, from clients when they come to recuperative care. Um, and we offer earbuds so everyone can, you know, look at their phone quietly and not disturb their roommates. Um, that's also a popular item. Uh, laundry facilities in the business center and Mary Isaac Center is available to the recuperative care folks. And um, as well as access to Petaluma Health Center medical providers. Uh, currently, they're on site two days a week, but as of November 6th, they're going to be coming three days a week, which is amazing. Um, and they're going to be spending that extra day specifically there to see recuperative care clients. So that's a wonderful. Um, we offer peer mentors assigned at intake. Every person that comes in for an intake in recuperative care um, has a peer mentor, someone that has been in recuperative care for at least a few days. And it's kind of their quote unquote welcome buddy and, and shows them the ropes and answers questions and makes them feel a little more comfortable in the new space. And last but not least, our recuperative care specialists are amazing. Um, they're on site daily to help schedule medical appointments, as I mentioned, refill and pick up prescriptions, apply for benefits, um, build their life skills and connect them to the community resources. And most importantly, obtain documents of identification to get the client housing ready. Um, recuperative care is typically a 90-day stay. It can be extended if somebody um, needs medical respite longer than that. Um, but typically, within those 90 days, we like to get people ready for, you know, for housing to move on to the shelter or people's village and where they can continue their journey to housing and they have all their documents ready to go. All right. And I did mention our awesome recuperative care team. Here we are. Um, to the left is Nurse Annie. Everyone knows Nurse Annie um, from Petaluma Health Center. She actually started the original recuperative care at Cosmary Isaac Center back in, gosh, I think it was 2013 maybe, uh, when it was just a few bunk beds um, downstairs in the main dorm. And look at us today. Um, so Annie is still a great asset to the, um, the recuperative care team. Um, in the center, we have Jessica, Pat, Garrett, and Nadia from left to right. Um, and then, of course, there's me looking busy in recuperative care. <laughs> so that is our amazing team. So COTS recuperative care, our, our focus is really to stabilize the client's health, first and foremost. That's our job. Um, that's, it's hard to move on to other steps when your health is, is just, you know, uh, just unstable. Um, but then once the person is starting to feel better, they're starting to get their health care in order. Then we promote them with managing their own medical treatment plan. As I mentioned, 90 days is not a very long, long time in a program. So we need to prepare them to manage their own medical treatment plan for after they leave us, um, where that's how to make their own medical appointments, how to call for prescription refills, uh, where to pick them up, and, and things like that. Um, they will need to know once they're in housing and on their own, right? Um, and then third, we help them work toward achieving their self-identified goals, uh, health and housing goals. Um, and that goes along with our models here, person-centered care. We don't tell our clients what they need to work on um, or what, what their goals are. We, we help them figure it out for themselves um, and then help them get there. Um, and then we strength-based case management. It can be really easy to focus on all the things that are going wrong, especially when you're experiencing homelessness. But we really like to focus on bringing out and helping folks identify what their strengths are and their skills are to get themselves out of homelessness. Um, we also use the harm reduction model, low barrier. Um, you're not required to be sober to be in recuperative care. Um, however, we do encourage everybody to consider recovery um, and help them with steps to get there if that's what they wanna do. And then of course, trauma-informed care. It's a traumatic experience being being homeless just in and of itself. So uh, we definitely approach with lots of compassion and um, empathy for, for people's situations and deliver trauma-informed care. And I'm just gonna briefly touch here on a client's story. Um, this is Florence. She's been with COTS for almost a year now um, in a few different programs. Um, and she's actually gonna be featured in our um, upcoming newsletter. I believe it comes out next week. Um, so you will be able to read more about her story, but uh, Florence is first time homeless. She was displaced from her home last year when uh, she was hospitalized and had a few um, health conditions. Um, because she was able to come to recuperative care, she was able to have multiple surgeries over the last year. Um, maybe we don't realize this because this is an, an issue for us, but surgeons don't want to do surgeries if there's nowhere safe in, you know, for you to continue your recovery afterwards, right? And for those of us with homes, maybe that's not even a discussion, but for, you know, for these folks, um, 
they cannot have these surgeries unless they have a safe place to go to. So recuperative care does provide that. Um, anyway, uh, Florence um, is very self-sufficient with managing her own health care. She makes her own health appointments. Um, she also served as a peer mentor for other recuperative care clients. It was just wonderful how much attention she gave people and answered questions and gave them tips for success. Um, Florence has been in recuperative care a couple times due to having multiple surgeries. Uh, we've been there for her every time she's had a surgery um, and happy to be so. Um, so she went from recuperative care to the uh, Mary Isaac Center Emergency Shelter. Um, and now she's currently in People's Village where I'm very happy to report her housing application was just approved. And she is gonna be working on moving to her permanent housing. So um, we're very happy about that. And I think this is the end of my segment here. So I'm gonna pass it on to the amazing Garrett Crane. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, uh, hello everybody. Um, my name is Garrett Cram, the Associate Director of Shelter Services here at Cox. So I am responsible for administrating uh, the Mary Isaac Center, the first floor 90 person congregate emergency shelter and also um, recuperative care. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how things are going in recuperative care in particular, uh, focusing on what is our exit policy and what does that look like? So uh, recuperative, cat, excuse me, recuperative care staff um, begin transition planning with our clients um, from the day of entry. Um, and in part, this is to make sure that we're providing ample time to ensure client safe transition to housing or another suitable living um, environment. Because our clients are coming to us in such a vulnerable state health-wise, it's imperative that we give ample time to secure these safe transition options, especially because we have, in theory, a pretty short window of time to work with them, right? A standard recuperative care stay is 90 days. We can get an extension for another 90 if that individual is still needing additional time for their recovery. Um, even with those timelines that set in place is kind of the best practice and the standard. We uh, we have a focus on on providing effective care management to ensure that none of our clients are going to be exited to the street or that they're not exited somewhere that's not going to benefit them, right? So even if we have someone who's been in recuperative care for that 180 days, if we have been unable to identify a really safe and concrete transition destination for them, we will do our best to hold on to them beyond that 180 days if necessary to make sure that we can find that, right? So we're not exiting people at, at, at all costs to the street um, to ensure that they're safe and healthy and can continue their recovery, right? So some of our outcomes for this last quarter, we served 15 clients in recuperative care, right? We have six beds currently. Um, so that's from July to September. We had one individual who transitioned downstairs from recuperative care to the Mary Isaac Center emergency shelter. We had one individual who transitioned directly to People's Village. And then we had two folks who were permanently housed directly out of recuperative care, which doesn't happen all the time, um, but is a huge win for us when that does occur. Um, and then we had three individuals who went to a higher level of care, um, and that could happen for a, a number of reasons. Occasionally, we'll have an individual who's referred to us that really is more of a fit for end-of-life care, such as hospice, and so we begin working to make those transitions happen, or sometimes a, an individual's chronic condition kind of flares up again, and so they end up needing to go back into the hospital. Um, and so we make sure that when that does happen, we're connecting those people um, with their centers of care to make sure that that care is continued to be provided. Um, and much like Florence, who Julia touched on, we have folks who will come in and out of recuperative care for these reasons, right? Sometimes we'll have someone who comes to us, they just transitioned out of a skilled nursing facility, and then boom, they have a new condition arise or a continuation. Um, so we get them back to the hospital, they end up getting um, 
admitted and stay there for a while, go back to a skilled nursing facility. And then maybe three months later, we get another referral from them and they're, they're back in recuperative care. So our doors are open to that return flow um, because we're here to help. And that's, that's what we're all about. So that's why those numbers may seem a little wonky, right? We served 15 people. We only had seven exits. Some of those people continued on past the 90 days of that quarter. Some transitioned right at the start of October. So those, those aren't um, captured here either. So you may be thinking, we're offering six beds already. Why expand recuperative care? Well, in our work, as we've been serving and working with our um, community health partners, we've seen a growing need for this service in Sonoma County. There are a few providers who are offering recuperative care uh, outside of COPS, notably Catholic Charities offers their Nightingale services um, in a similar fashion. But we saw that that need was greater than what um, we were providing or what the county had to offer um, because there are so few of us who are doing it. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we're able to serve the most vulnerable and have a suitable place for them to recover um, from these occasional or chronic health conditions. Um, so we've heard from uh, a little caveat special point in there as well, is that we've also heard from our community met, um, health providers that uh, the county is, is needing an increased access to hospice spaces, right? Um, the existing hospice facilities, you know, typically they're, they're full up. So we're seeing folks who are getting sent down south to places like San Diego for that type of care because there's just not enough space um, in the county. And so we're currently working with Providence right now um, to hopefully in the future offer two of our 20 new beds as um, hospice beds to allow for two hospice patients to reside um, in the Lasser Health and Wellness Center um, and be cared for by Providence uh, hospice nurses. And then here's just a glimpse at some of our new spaces here at the Lasser Health and Wellness Center. On the left, you'll see two photos of what will be our community room. Um, we have a TV, books, couches, a table. We're going to have games and things in there um, for folks to have a, a space to relax um, and just kind of hang out. And in part, some of this, the idea behind it was we wanted to allow them to have this space so that we can encourage our, our clients in recuperative care to spend as much time separated from that 90 person congregate shelter downstairs where maybe they might be more exposed to um, the, the germs and bacteria that comes with um, 90 plus other individuals in one space, right? We have folks who are in fragile health states and so encouraging them to be in a more controlled and sterile environment felt important for us. And then on the right is a, a snapshot of Pat, excuse me, Pat Higgins, he's our um, recuperative care community liaison, speaking with a group of, I believe those are some of our donors who came for a tour of the space, and that is our uh, what will be our dining room space. So we'll also have um, a separate space from our dining room downstairs for our folks in recuperative care to gather and eat their meals. Um, and that will look like various different things, right? We'll be bringing meals up from our kitchen to provide to um, the clients in recuperative care, but we also have space to store things like medically tailored meals um, when we have individuals who need modified diets or really health conscious diets so that we can offer that to them as well. Great. I'm going to throw it back to Julia. All right. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to make note about the expansion space. If you've been to Mary Isaac Center, um, this is where our former permanent supportive housing units was. So it's the hallway on the second floor. Um, the rooms are anywhere from two beds to six beds in, in a room. Um, and that is really helpful for to, you know, because right now it's a co-ed dorm, so then we can have rooms separated by gender and we can have um, people that maybe have behavioral, you know, issues or maybe for one reason or another need to be, um, you know, in their own space in order for us to serve them. Um, that it's really beneficial that we have these, these different kinds of spaces to accommodate the client. 
So moving on um, about our referral process. I did just put in the chat since so many people were interested in getting the referral form that we do have a new online referral form, which I'll talk about more in a minute, but I just wanted to note that the link is in the chat. Um, so we accept referrals from just about, you know, just about anybody in the community. Traditionally, it's been hospitals. Um, as well as skilled nursing and other medical facilities. But we also you know, re receive referrals from medical providers, whether that's health centers, community clinics, a primary care doctor, um, you know, mobile, mobile health clinics. Um, we also accept referrals from homeless service providers and social service programs, um, as well as uh, managed care organizations or you know, health insurance plans. Um, and that is uh, from Providence, I'm sorry, not Providence, Partnership or uh, Kaiser. Um, and then also now we're opening up referrals to family, friends, and even for self-referrals. Um, we, you know, we recognize that there's folks that, you know, may have a friend that's living homeless and they don't know if they're engaged in services, but they want to find out if recuperative care is right for them. And they're absolutely able uh, to send a referral for, for them or have the person send one for themselves. Uh, to be eligible for recuperative care, um, you do need to be a single adult, um, age 18 plus. Uh, we are only able to accommodate, you know, single individuals. Um, either you're experiencing homelessness, at risk of homelessness, or your current home is inaccessible or unsafe due to lack of in-home support. Um, this has, with the introduction of CalAIM, we have expanded um, the eligibility to beyond literally people that are experienced literal homelessness. Um, if someone has an accident or a surgery and they can't return to their home temporarily um, because it's unsafe, maybe there's stairs that they can't use for the next six weeks or something like that, uh, we will consider them for recuperative care. Um, an individual that has, they do need to have an acute medical condition from which they can recover or a currently unmanaged chronic condition that needs to be stabilized. Um, I can't tell you how many folks come to us with unmanageable diabetes that sends them to the ER over and over again. Um, so we help them work on their insulin and, you know, make sure they're checking their blood sugar and understand what the readings mean. Um, the re recuperative care specialists do an amazing job of that. Um, other eligibility requirement is that they need to be independent with basic activities of daily living, or BADL. You may have heard this term thrown around a bit. Um, this is basically saying the person can manage to go to the bathroom themselves. They can change themselves, bathe, eat, kind of all the basic things you go through in your day. Um, if someone needs some, you know, really minor assistance, we may be able to offer that. But in general, you know, we're not a skilled nursing facility or a long-term care facility, so we can't offer hands-on assistance um, with, with a lot of these activities because we're just not licensed to. Um, and generally, that's not what recuperative care provides. Um, and last but not least, individuals must be able to take their medications independently and as prescribed. We don't dispense medications or store them for the patient. We will, however, sit down with them with a pill organizer and watch them put their medications in the pill organizer or help them read the label so they understand what their doctor is telling them to do as far as how to take their meds. Next all right, submitting a referral to recuperative care. So there's two ways to do this. Um, you could submit the referral. We have a referral form that has generally been used by healthcare providers um, that asks a lot of like medical related questions. This form is a PDF. You can fax this form in or send it by secure email. Um, in general, we request this form be accompanied by medical records that show the individual's diagnosis, the medication list, and what their treatment plan is. Um, we will, we will confirm that we received the referral within a couple hours. Um, if the person's accepted, then we will schedule an intake, um, you know, based on the patient's estimated discharge date. Um, and intakes are performed by appointment only, uh, but we do offer them seven days a week in normal business hours, about 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. But as I mentioned earlier, we also do have a online referral form, and it's been a long time coming. Um, if you want to change the slide, uh, there's um, it's on our website. Um, you can find it at cots.org slash recuperative hyphen care. Um, basically, this is for folks that maybe aren't, if you're not a medical provider, if you're referring yourself or a friend, this form's a little more user-friendly, not so much medical, medical jargon on it. Um, so we just ask that you fill it out the best as you can. There is an option to attach 
medical records or a hospital discharge summary if you have it. I do want to stress that this form of um, referring to recuperative care is HIPAA compliant and we take privacy very seriously. We won't share medical records and, um, and the, the, re the records are only used for the purpose of deciding if they're appropriate for placement in the program. Um, and you submit this form, attach what you have, and then we'll get back to you within 48 hours or so um, for this form. Um, when patients come to recuperative care, we do ask that they come with pharmacy orders for a minimum of 14 days of medications. Um, they can have the medications in hand, or they can, um, just as long as the orders are sent to the pharmacy, to either to be ready for pickup same day, or to be delivered by Creekside Pharmacy. Either way, we just want to make sure that everyone has their meds right when they get to recuperative care. Um, also, any orders for therapies and treatments. Obviously, if someone needs oxygen, we don't want to accept somebody that doesn't, that oxygen's not going to be delivered at the same time or before they show up, right? So, because um, it's a necessary therapy. So, um, yeah, any orders for home health, whether it's wound care with a nurse or physical therapy, all of that should be in order before they come to us. Um, durable medical equipment, if they need a wheelchair or a walker, that needs to be, um, must arrive with or before the patient as well. Um, we do prefer that a scheduled follow-up appointment with the patient's primary care physician or their surgeon, perhaps, if that's the case, um, is already scheduled. Um, their hospital discharge summary, and we ask, please, please, no more than three bags of belongings. Um, we know that it, it's important to have the belongings with them, but, you know, we can't, we can't accommodate more than three bags. And um, I do want to make note that um, if you're not a medical provider, like, don't worry about all this stuff. If you just maybe, when you were referred to us, if you just know maybe the last hospital visit that they had and know what hospital it was, we can get permit, we can get a written permission from the client or the patient, rather, um, to contact the hospital to access that rec those records. Um, so we can learn more about their medical needs and see if they're appropriate for recuperative care. So don't let lack of medical knowledge or a medical documentation deter you from applying uh, or referring to recuperative care. And I'm just going to wrap up my part here with uh, just kind of going over our three values um, for recuperative care. Safety is number one. It's a number one human need. We all need to feel safe um, and that our basic, you know, human needs are met. And um, only until this, not until this happens, can you actually focus on other things on next steps. So we know this is important for our clients and they feel very unsafe when they leave the hospital, um, a little confused and they're maybe in physical pain. So it's really important that they feel safe and they feel welcome when they come to us. Um, also compassion, our clients have been through a lot. We all know it. And um, we recognize that the trauma that comes from being homeless um, is, is, is enough, you know, to, um, to create, you know, lots of issues for a person. So we just try to create a non-judgmental space um, for compassionate care. And last but not least, recovery. That's what we're all about in recuperative care. Um, our primary focus is that the client has the support they need to recover physically and mentally, whatever their condition is. Um, and then we help them, you know, develop the tools and use the tools to move on to safe and stable housing. So, yeah, that, that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Erin, I think. Great. Um, I am, I thought we had a Q&A slide, but let's uh, do our q and I'm going to go over what we have in the chat. Just as a reminder, if you joined us late, this meeting is recorded. We will be sending out the recording and the slides. Um, so for everyone who is um, and wondering about that, that'll happen today. And also in that email, we will be sending out a link um, to the new online referral um, page. So, um, so don't worry about that. I know some of you have put your email um, in and um, we'll make sure that you guys get that. Um, if you haven't gotten a tour yet, if you'd like to tour the space, please feel free to reach out um, either to myself um, or to Chris um, and we can get that scheduled for you. Um, just going to start with a few questions just in case people miss them in the chat. Um, and they wanted to know, um, I think you answered Daisy's question about being able to get a, help get a client a bed in a program when the doctor won't schedule surgery until, um, you have a bed first. Um, and so Julia, do you just want to answer that question for everyone so they can understand yeah. what we do? 
Yeah, this isn't uncommon that um, a physician won't schedule a surgery until they know for sure that there's somewhere that the person can recover afterwards. Um, so in this situation, we we can provide a, just a, you know, a brief kind of letter of agreement um, that recuperative care is available to the client after surgery. Um, it does depend upon bed availability. Um, and, you know, if the person is able to, you know, if they're independent enough with their ADLs afterwards, um, but we will um, we will offer recuperative care as as the aftercare location for the client, um, and oftentimes this does you know help the surgeon feel comfortable with scheduling the surgery, and then we'll work with the referring person um, on make sure that there's going to be a bed available at that time after the surgery. And uh, Daisy also asked a very important question: Do we have Spanish speaking staff at Cots Recuperative Care? And indeed, we do. Um, so uh, she's on the call today. They will, um, you and or your clients will be connecting with Nadia, um, who is awesome. Um, yeah, I'd and, also like to add that we have um, documents, our intake documents, as well as our case management documents are translated into Spanish as well. Um, mm -hmm. So folks can know what, know what they're signing, know what the, you know, know what the guidelines and the rules are of the program. And some uh, related asking clients bring their own um, DME, like walker wheelchair, et cetera, and want to say, yes, they can. We also do have um, sort of a small uh, fleet of that type of, those type of uh, materials, walkers and wheelchairs and things like that on site too, so we can support clients in that way. Um, and see, and has the bad expansion happened already? You taking referrals? The expansion, we will be going from six to 12 beds the first week of November. Um, and Julia, are you actively taking referrals for those additional spaces? Yeah, I mean, if, if you have a, somebody that maybe, you know, can wait, wait a few weeks, um, maybe they're not having surgery for a couple weeks, um, then um, we will certainly take referrals now and, and keep them in mind um, for, for future placement. Yeah. Yep. And then to clarify, we are starting by moving from the six to 12, letting everybody get settled and then moving on to our, and then continuing to add more space um, just so it's not quite such a large jump at once. Um, do we have other questions that people want to put in the chat? I think I grabbed everything. Um, I think Robbie asked if we accept referrals from EDs. I'm assuming the answer is yes. That's our primary source of referrals uh, from Kaiser, especially. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 a little difficult because sometimes they don't have all the the history on the patient, um, or don't you know don't know much about their current condition. Um, however, we do try to uh, accept them if we can. Yeah, um, we just need to have somewhat of an idea of what their medical needs are. And Chris reiterated, we're going from 6 to 12 the first week of November, and then from 12 up to the maximum capacity of 20 beds once folks and clients, staff and clients are stabilized following the initial transition. We anticipate having all 20 beds available by the end of January, early February. Uh, Robbie has a question. Go ahead. Hi, thank, thank you for this wonderful um, information and expansion. I appreciate it. Um, when the slide was up that said that there could also be self-referrals, if somebody were to talk to me and they were interested and had the eligibility criteria because of what they're experiencing, would you prefer that I complete the recuperative care form and fax it, or would you like me to simply give them the referral phone number? I think the preference would be that you would assist them either with the online app, online referral form or send in the paper referral form for them. I think it's because you would have you have more knowledge. Maybe you might have more knowledge of their medical condition um, and what their care needs are. Um, so we would like to get a service provider lens um, on the on the person's condition um, if possible. Um, I think you know the forms can be can be daunting for for some people. So you know I think a service provider would would, would give us more information that we need to make a decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, um, all of the contact information for everyone here today will be in the follow up email. So if you have questions that we that you think of afterwards, please reach out. Um, we are more than happy to answer. 
Um, I just wanted to share kind of as a closing um, how through ways you can help recuperative care um, in addition to referring clients. Um, but one is if you, um, your organization is ever, you or an, your organization is looking for a volunteer opportunity, um, we always have um, opportunities in Mar at Mary's Table to help prep and serve meals. Um, and so with the additional service of meals, um, that need will be growing. Um, so we would love to have you in, your ki in the kitchen. Um, certainly um, supporting the, supporting COTS um, by donating, whether that is a, a, through money or through in-kind support. We, we have a wish list online for things that we always need in recuperative care. And Julia mentioned that we always in need of chargers and um, earbuds and um, other things. We always love to have a, like a full set of swippers so that clients can be engaging in helping keep their space clean. Um, and then just to share about the program. Um, so word of mouth is um, our, one of our best marketing tools. So as you interact with this program and it's beneficial to you, we hope that you share with it, other providers um, what, um, what we're doing and how it could potentially benefit their clients. Um, but with that, um, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who attended. Today, um, we are so grateful for your partnership. We couldn't do this without our community partners um, and providers. Um, so thank you for coming, thank you for learning and for supporting this work. And we will um, connect with you um, over email. So thank you everyone and have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.